Hello. Our family loves survival stories. October 1942, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker was flying a B-17 to deliver an important message to General MacArthur in New Guinea. Somewhere over the South Pacific, beyond the reach of radio transmission, the flying fortress became lost. Fuel ran low and the men ditched their plane in the ocean. For nearly a month, Captain Eddie and his companions fought the weather, the sharks, the scorching sun, but of all their enemies at sea, one proved most formidable, and that was starvation. As was their habit, the men dedicated time to worship God every day together. Together they prayed for deliverance, and together they sang hymns of praise. And then one day, Captain Eddie dozed off until he was awakened by something on his head, and it was a seagull. It was food, if Eddie could catch it. Captain Eddie caught the gull. Its flesh was eaten, its intestines were used for bait to catch fish. The survivors were sustained. Hope soared because a lone seagull, hundreds of miles from land, offered itself as a sacrifice. Eddie never forgot. 30 years later, every Friday night, Eddie filled his bucket with shrimp to feed the seagulls on the shore to remember the one who gave itself without a struggle. And this might surpass any survival story except for the one we just studied, right? A storm, an ark of salvation, wild animals, uncertain ending, in-laws. <laughs> but in times of uncomfortable waiting for rescue, do you ever feel God has ceased caring? Is God even interested in our situation? It's tough when there's a distance between our storm and God's answer, isn't it? From the time Noah entered the boat until they came out, it was over a year, 377 days. 377 days of wondering, but also 377 days of character building that manifested into a life of thankfulness to a promise-keeping God. And this is faith. Knowing the promises of God are guaranteed by the character of God. The promises of God are guaranteed by the character of God. That is faith. Faith is believing God's plan for our future includes shaping our character to live there. I'll say that again. Believing God's plan for our future includes shaping our character to live there. And faith is heartfelt thankfulness for God's love and grace and provision in the midst of spiritual and physical starvation. And this is faith. Focus on God's strength, not our ability. God always keeps his word. Saving faith trusts Jesus Christ for salvation. Saving faith waits on, worships, and obeys God. Saving faith waits on, worships, and obeys God. Would you please open your Bible to Genesis chapter 8? Please grab a pen and a notebook and please pray with me as we explore faith in God. Almighty God, we long to understand this beautiful gift of faith that you alone have placed in our hearts and you alone nurture. And we thank you that it is uh, a, a privilege to have faith that is grounded in you. Truth that we and put our feet solemnly on. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, in your name, amen. Well, God faithfully keeps his promises. God knows everything is now ready to implement the next step of his plan to rescue and restore his creation. Genesis chapter eight, verse one, God remembered Noah and all that were with him, and he sent a wind over the earth, and the water receded. Often, wind in the Bible alerts us to the presence and the power of God, the Holy Spirit. In this moment, God the Father remembered and God the Holy Spirit blew across the land to remove the flood of judgment. Isn't that powerful? How our God works three in one to do this incredible work of salvation for us. In faith, are you seeing the work of God the Holy Spirit removing sin and removing sin's judgment from your life? He does this. A heart of repentance can't 
hang on to sin, the Holy Spirit will remove it out once you have repented. What sin is God asking you to remove from your life? Will you let it go? Will you open your hand? Will you let the healing Holy Spirit sweep even the most entrenched sins out of your life? Faith is trusting God's strength to do this. The rain stopped, the water slowly recedes, and Noah and his family faithfully hold tight to the promises of God as they wait patiently, perched on the mountain of Ararat with water still surrounding them. Have you been there? Isolated on your own island, lonely, uncertain future, worrying about food and finances and friendships and family, worried about your future decisions, you're desperate to keep hope alive. What do you do? Well, God says you're not on an island. Don't trust yourself. Don't trust the circumstances around you. Don't look out and, and try to predict what's going to happen. Instead, trust God. Trust me, God says. Trust Jesus Christ as the only one who saves you. That is faith. How is your faith and trust seen in your actions? Will you search out God's promises in scripture? God faithfully kept Noah and all those in the ark safe from the flood, just as God promised. And now in chapter 8, verse 11, new life appears God sent out birds to test whether the planet was livable. And when the dove didn't return, um, God removed the covering from the ark. But Noah didn't leave the ark. Noah waited on God's direction. Faith is not acting on favorable circumstances. Faith is waiting on God for God's direction. No one knew God could be trusted to tell him when the time was right. So what do you need to wait on God to open the doors and let you step into a new world? For years, I've loved my job, but over the last year and a half, things have changed and I don't love it like I used to. I'm ready for a change. I have been praying diligently, faithfully. I've wanted to jump out of the boat, but I pray and I listen and I wait for God to say, come out of the ark, step into your new world and be fruitful. I haven't heard it yet, but I am confident when it's God's time, he will make that clear. Come out of the ark, Darcy, step into your new world. It's hard to stay in an undesirable situation, isn't it? As we trust God's timing, it's hard. But God is trustworthy. God helps us trust him. When God said it was time to unload, I am certain the family danced off the ship. What would you do if you were pent up in a stinky farmhouse for 377 days? In Genesis chapter 8, verse 20 says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. And the first thing he does is when Noah's feet hit dry ground is to build an altar to I built an altar to offer sacrifices. Noah's overflowing gratitude to God for what God has done. Our lives and our plan belong to God. And sacrifice is costly, but we have to let go of the life we've planned to enjoy the life God designed for us. We have to let go of the life we've planned in order to enjoy the life God designed for us. It's only reasonable that we offer our absolute best to our amazing God. And it seems in Noah's time of waiting, he was busy planning how he would worship God gloriously. How do you spend your time in the desert season, in the waiting season when you're on the island? How are you demonstrating thankfulness to God for his provision during your days lost at sea? Are you gathering others to worship God, to praise God, to ask for deliverance with you and remain hopeful in God's good, good heart? Thankful worship honors God. We have to make it a priority. In verse 21, the smell of the barbecue, it delighted God, didn't it? In verse 21, it says something really cool. It's, it says, the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, and he said some words in his heart. God said this in his heart, and yet those words are what is in Scripture. So Noah didn't know God said this. 
Do you ever wonder how God's heart thoughts are recorded in scripture? God's deepest thoughts revealed to us on, on this side of heaven centuries later through the Holy Spirit to Moses and eventually to us to treasure and trust as God's very heart on this side of heaven. I think of what it will be in eternity, but for today, isn't it remarkable that we would hear the very words of the heart of the God of the universe in this very intimate moment with one man on the planet. Total surrender gives us freedom and reckless abandon to trust the one who has proven he is so, so worthy. And this delights God. This is faith. Saving faith waits on, worships, and obeys God. God feels our adoration when we give full dedication. God feels our adoration when we give full dedication. Now, Noah and his family, they are really starting over, aren't they? New beginnings, both exciting and uncertain. Have you ever found yourself in the middle of your life, perhaps taking on a new career or a new marital status or a new medical diagnosis or a, a new home or even a new child that you didn't plan on? All that has been familiar or planned for is gone. Fear and anxiety creep in. There was precedence to be anxious when clouds formed, wasn't there? So in chapter 9, God gives Noah and Noah's family new ideas and a new focus for their new life. Instructions about reproduction and the animal kingdom and nutrition and even justice. In chapter 9, verse 1, he says, have children, grow your family. And we are also called to spiritually reproduce to fill the planet with people who delight in Jesus's rescue plan for sinners, to germinate fruits of this Holy Spirit in our homes and workplaces and church and neighborhoods. Are you spiritually reproducing love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness? How are you doing that? And how might you do it more to the glory of God? And who is God asking you to share your faith? your confidence, and your experience with Jesus, who is needy to hear faith in Christ alone. In verse 2, we see man's uh, responsibility for creation. It's interesting, isn't it? After living in this close proximity of the 377-day voyage, overnight, animals develop a dread of mankind. I, I saw a darling little squirrel sitting on our porch against the perfect backdrop of Mount Rainier. I ran to get my camera. The squirrel was highly suspicious and he scampered away. I don't think the squirrel's fear was the original design of God. Well, now he gives us instructions for nutrition. Initially, man ate foods from the garden, and now God gives the other half of the dinner menu. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just one stipulation, don't eat bloody meat. Blood means life. Blood means life. God points the infinite worth of Jesus's blood, the price of our salvation. The blood of Christ is forever innocent, infinitely precious, perfectly justifying, always cleansing, and fully sanctifying. And God's last instruction is on justice. In verses 5 and 6, he says, For your lifeblood I will demand an accounting. God values the life he creates and demands an accounting for a life cut short by evil. This is different than what happened with Cain, right? He was able to live. But, but now God says, For your lifeblood, for life that is, sh is shed, I will demand your own accounting. In verse 9, God said to Noah then, I will now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. God voluntarily binds his life to ours. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? God's covenants give us life, identity, love, and protection. These covenants, they're markers, they're certainties. God has put in his story that we as his followers can stake our faith on. Something stable to stake our faith on, not something that's just mysterious, but actual markers that prove God's promises and what God says is worth trusting. 
God leaves these markers to remind us of his goodness, to give our faith substance. Remember God's initial creations? Out of the formless nothing, God made earth and life and he pronounced it good. That was a first marker. And then God knew we needed fellowship with other people, so God made woman. Another marker. And the flood is a, another grand signpost of God and he gave us the marker of the rainbow. God's promises and covenants and markers, they open our eyes to see ourselves through God's eyes. They open our eyes to help us have deep, deep wells of faith in God. Let's look at verse 12. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. See, God loves unconditionally. Keeping the covenant is completely dependent on God. We cannot earn or lose God's love. We are fully dependent on God's grace. In verse 15, God explains he loves us unconditional and eternally. Never again will the waters destroy all life. Sin and consequence will exist. But God says in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 to 3, don't be afraid, for I have ransomed you. When you go through deep waters, trouble and difficulty, I will be with you and you will not drown. That's God's loving kindness and, and believing what he says is faith. We are wrapped in God's clear intention for us to live as chosen, deeply loved people of faith. You are wrapped in this as you look in the Bible. Will you allow God's words to wrap you in faith in God? How do we faithfully live into identity as a child of God? There's three things. So first, be authentic. And second, listen to God. And third, remember God's precedence. Be authentic, listen to God, remember God's precedence. The first is uh, be authentic. Because of the things we done, have done in this lifetime, we doubt our ability to be loved by God, don't we? Many people do, for sure. Shame blinds us from seeing our need for God. If you're masking your brokenness, let that mask go. Let the Spirit's wind blow that shame and brokenness away. God has designed it that way, and God loves you deeply just as you are. Nothing, nothing that you have done in this life separates you from God. Be authentic. Second is listen to God. In prayer and Bible study, God reveals his heart. Scripture by scripture, we practice tuning our ears to better hear the voice of God. If you want to hear God's voice, you need to read God's word. When it seems there is a delay in God's resolution, remember God's future is always more glorious than we could ever dream. If there's a, a delay in, in getting the, the answers that you have long prayed for, remember the future that God is creating is more glorious than what you could ever dream. Third is remember God's precedence. When have you experienced God's faithfulness? Hang on to your history of God in life's tough moments. God is faithful and God fills us with faith to trust him because saving faith waits on, worships, and obeys God. So here's what I pray you believe. God is faithful to us and his promises. God is faithful to us and his promises. Will you please pray with me? Mighty God, we love, love that you are a true and genuine and, and real God, the God of the universe. You exist and you have proven yourself over and over to us. So we don't have faith in something that is mysterious. We have faith in a God who is trustworthy, whose promises are true, who has made covenants and conversations and promises with people throughout history that we today can put our faith in. Because you are a personal God, you come to us, you reveal yourself to us, you hear us, you answer us, and most of all, you love us. And we're so grateful. And it's in your gracious name, Jesus, Lord Christ, we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray this. Amen. I bless you.